Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the January 24th meeting of the Planning Commission. Thank you all for coming out. Um, I'd like to welcome Sam Cannon, who's going to get sworn in here shortly as a, our new commissioner. Um, if you'd all please stand and join me in the flag salute. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, the Republic of Canada, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, Sue, would you do roll call, please? Yes. Um, Mr. Cannon hasn't been sworn in, but Mr. Cannon. Here. Mr. Herzog. Here. Mr. Johnson. Here. Mr. Nader. Here. Mr. Hauge. Here. Mr. Sevison. Yes. Mr. Moss. Here. Thank you. Thank you. Now time for a report from our planning director, PJ. Good morning. DJ Avaldi with the Planning Services Division. Uh, first of all, I also want to welcome uh, Commissioner Sam Cannon, uh, new District 1 appointment. We had a chance to meet last week and kind of give him a preview of all the activity that's going on in the county right now. And uh, he walked away with boxes of reading material. So I'm certain he spent that time over the last several days uh, going through all that. So anyway, I uh, appreciate your willing to serve on the commission and we'll uh, swear you in uh, shortly here. Uh, my report's really brief. Uh, the Board <laughs> of Supervisors, uh, uh, they haven't met since we last met ourselves, so I don't have anything to report there, but they are meeting up in Tahoe next Monday and Tuesday. Uh, planning Commission meetings coming up. Uh, we're still scheduled for the February, 4 February 14th meeting uh, here in Auburn. It's going to be a full day. Uh, we have a couple draft EIR meetings scheduled for that day, the Sunset Area Plan, Placer Ranch Specific Plan, and also the Quarry Ridge uh, Professional Office Park in Granite Bay. And there may be an, another item or two on that agenda. Uh, and I'm still trying to get the February 28th meeting dialed in, uh, which is still scheduled for Tahoe. And I'll update you at the next meeting if that's uh, confirmed or not. Uh, and then when we get to March, March 14th, we'll be back in Auburn. Uh, so we got a big agenda. My report is short. Any questions? Thank you very much. All right, much. thank you. All right, next on the agenda, we'll be swearing in Commissioner Cannon. Who are you doing those honors? Would you like to stand, sure. please? And go ahead and repeat after me. I, Sam Cannon. I, Sam Cannon, do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend, that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the United States, and the Constitution of the State of California, and the Constitution of the State of California, against all enemies, foreign and domestic, against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the United States. And the, Constitu and the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. And that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. Thank you very much. Sam, if you'd like a couple of minutes with your mic on to tell us a little bit about yourself or anything you'd like to say before we dive in. Put me right on the spot as soon as I get here in the hot seat. I'm Sam Cannon. It's my pleasure to be here. I, I want to thank Supervisor Gore for this um, uh, honor for being appointed to District 1 Planning Commissioner. And, and I would also like to thank all the county staff and my commissioner colleagues. I uh, um, live in Roseville in District 1, obviously. I'm the father of two girls. Uh, my wife is Michelle. She's an attorney, a partner attorney in a, a downtown Sacramento law firm specializes in education law. I come from the state legislature where I retired in, in June of this last year. 
after 20 years and some 10 years before that in other public service in another jurisdiction. I've served um, two terms on the city, city Planning Commission in Roseville and three terms on the City Public Utilities Commission. And it's my great honor to, um, to take over for my predecessor, uh, the Honorable Richard Ricucci. So um, thank you very much, and I look forward to working with everyone. All right. Thank you very much. Welcome. Um, next on the agenda now is the time for public comment. These comments would be re related to matters not on today's agenda. Mr. Ricucci. District 1, I just want to take this opportunity to formally uh, recognize Sam Cannon, um, District 1 Supervisor Bonnie Gore. Couldn't have made a better choice. You already heard the vast experience, and I met with him, turned over a bunch of my books that I had for this coming month here uh, at my house, and, and told him that about 90% of what he already knows uh, at the city of Roseville is, is, is followed through here in the, in the county. It's a few little different procedures and stuff. I didn't mention to him that he had to watch out for some of the other planning commissioners, though sometimes they, they get a little ornery, but uh, <laughs> that, that's so. Now, that's not true, obviously. Uh, I do want to thank uh, EJ on December 13th, kind of caught me by surprise and said all kinds of good things about me. And I just wanted to make sure that I said the right things about his staff and stuff and the other planning commissioners. But it's been a pleasure, actually, this eight, last eight years of serving as the planning commissioner. Um, and the staff is just a great staff uh, and great planning commissioners. And I, I want to wish uh, Sam all the best. And I'm here just to kind of keep an eye on things that you treat him right. Thank you so much. Thank you. My name is Jean Piet. I live at 5395 Bell Road in North Auburn. And I'm here to talk about Protect Rural Placer. Um, we live on Bell Road, and we are in opposition to what the county has planned to do um, regarding access so they can have um, uh, the public go to the current Hidden Falls. They have uh, plans to expand the Hidden Falls, which is a regional park, already beyond the definition of a regional park. And um, I want to point out that those of us in Protectoral Plaza, and if it's all right with you, I'd like to ask uh, that these be, would you? All of us in our community who live in a residential agricultural uh, community have formed Protect Rural Placer. And this is a learning experience for us, um, something brand new to my husband and I. And we are beginning to realize that when the parks administrator took the request to purchase the property that is in question, he bypassed you. As far as we understand, he bypassed the commissioners on the Park Commission, and he went straight to the supervisors. Part of the reason there was this hurry was because of the current Hidden Falls Park that has turned into a disaster. And he was anxious to find some way out, according to what we've heard. We know that the Parks Commissioners did not know about the action. And I just want to say that we have looked at you as the enemy. But evidently, if it's true that you didn't know, we apologize. We would like to ask that you take the proper steps now on behalf of the residents and encourage your supervisors to not vote for the purchase of the land in question. We're available uh, if you have questions. We'd like to answer any questions that you may have. And you can see 
that we do have a website and we are available. So please, uh, we'd like to communicate with you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else have? Come on up, please. Uh, good morning. My name's Leslie Warren. Um, I'm the chair of the Alliance for Environmental Leadership, which is a collaboration of 14 civic and environmental organizations in Placer County. And we came together in October of 2017 um, out of concern uh, about regional projects um, that individual environmental and civic organizations were commenting on and um, the fact that we thought if we got our voices together, um, we could probably um, economize resources and be more efficient and better get our message across. So um, we organized to address projects of regional significance, and one that we are looking at is the Sunset Industrial Area that you'll be hearing at your Planning Commission meeting on the 14th of February. Um, if you've looked at the <coughs> environmental document for the Sunset Project, I mean, it's massive and intimidating, I know. I used to be a planning commissioner for several years, so I sat where you're sitting. But if you go to table two um, in the first volume, um, there's probably 30 pages which summarize the impacts of the project, and 57 different items are identified as significant and unmitigatable, meaning if you threw every remedy you could at the project, it would still have significant detrimental environmental impacts on public health and the environment. So I just encourage you to read um, table, table two um, as you go through this, and um, especially Sam, um, because the traffic um, issues of this project on Roseville are, are quite interesting, and they can't be mitigated. Um, but I really wanted to just introduce the Alliance for Environmental Leadership and let you know that we'll be here on the 14th to talk with you. Um, and I didn't want you to see us as um, speaking against the Sunset Industrial Area, because I recognize that from since the 80s, uh, the counties had growth ambitions in this area, which unfortunately is a wetland prairie. Um, but on the 14th, um, we're going to be submitting uh, a citizen-initiated smart growth plan for the same area um, that I hope you'll give careful consideration to because the plan that the county staff has put forth, uh, it can't be certified as an EIR. The impacts are so vast and significant. And the alternative three that the EIR consultant's recommending doesn't allow the county to achieve the growth ambitions that it has for the Sunset Industrial Area. But our um, citizen-initiated smart growth plan actually allows the county to exceed its housing goals, exceed its employment goals, and meet its economic development goals, but in a way that doesn't affect intersections in Roseville, um, and we'll have um, quality of life characterizations that protect what we love here about Placer County. So I know my time's up. I just wanted to let you know that um, when we come on uh, the 14th, um, it's going to be coming, bringing um, a constructive alternative that we'll also be submitting um, to the EIR consultant in the county. But um, I just wanted to let you know about the Alliance, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to make public comment? All right, seeing none, we'll close that portion of the meeting. And looks like we're in time for our first timed item here, the United Auburn Indian Community School. Oh, did I pass that right up, didn't I? The consent agenda. 
Is there anything on the consent agenda that anybody from the public would like removed and dealt with separately? Seeing none, we'll take a motion if there is one to be made for the consent agenda. I'll move to approve the consent agenda. Second. A motion and second. Roll call, please, sir. I have a first by Commissioner Hauge and a second by Commissioner Herzog. So a vote from Mr. Cannon, please. I'm going to abstain because I was not present for the last. Thank you. Mr. Herzog? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Nader? Yes. Mr. Hauge? Yes. Mr. Sevison? Mr. Moss? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Now on to our first item, the United Auburn Indian Community School Minor Use Permit. Emily. <laughs> okay, now we're on our way. <laughs> uh, my name is Emily Setzer, and I'm presenting this uh, project, the United. Auburn Indian Community School Project, um, and we're bringing forward the final environmental impact report today and a request for a minor use permit. So the project is um, bordering the town of Loomis. So this is the town of Loomis, and then here's the project site, and it also affronts Taylor Road. And it's mostly a rural area, except for the town of Loomis to the west there. The land use for the project site is designated rural residential with 2.3 to 4.6 acre minimums. It's within the Horseshoe Bar Penryn Community Plan area. And it's surrounded by a rural residential to this side, rural estate to the north, low density residential to the south, and then the town of Loomis. Uh, the site is 45 acres right here, um, and it is zoned residential agriculture combining a minimum lot area of 100,000 square feet. And the zoning surrounding it is residential single family. Um, that red is commercial, and then again, the town of Loomis. Today's requested entitlement for the project is to allow the construction of a school facility in the residential agriculture zoning district, and that is permitted with a minor use permit for our zoning ordinance. Uh, this project has started in 2017. Um, we took it to the Horseshoe Bar Pender Municipal Advisory Council in summer of 2017 as an informational item, and it received no controversy um, really limited discussion, actually. Um, that fall in 2017, the notice of preparation for the EIR was published with the public comment period. We held a public scoping meeting in November of 2017, and no members of the public came. <laughs> um, and then this past fall, the draft EIR was released for public comment. And we had a planning commission hearing at that time also, and received only positive comments of support. Existing conditions on this site are that it was uh, mostly already developed on this northern portion of the site here. Uh, the southern portion extends further back and is uh, limited development back there. The project site was previously had multiple uses. It functioned as an orchard, so there uh, is some arsenic in the soil that requires remediation. Um, it was also used as a bed and breakfast and an event center. The bed and breakfast has not been operational for the past 10 years. So in general, the northern portion of the site <coughs> already has been highly disturbed, and most of the proposed uh, uses would occur in those northern portions. And then the southern two-thirds would be primarily left undeveloped. On the site right now, there are five structures. 
a water supply well and septic system, 65 parking spaces, and an irrigation stock pond. The project proposes to demolish the existing structures, uh, remediate the site, and coordination has already been um, undergoing with the Department of Toxic Substance Control to do so, and to construct a pre-K through eighth grade private school for the UAIC uh, grade school children, construct a tribal education center, and a tribal cultural center. These would total about 48,000 square feet in, for the, between the three buildings. There would also be a small ball field, two play areas, and a nature trail. The site would support up to 100 UAIC students and 43 staff members, and would operate Monday through Friday from 7.30 to 4.30. This project would also do some improvements to the existing irrigation stock pond and pier. A number of events were analyzed in the EIR too, because uh, as it is a school, events will be desired to occur. Um, three large events were analyzed per year with up to 200 attendees, and those would be on weekdays, either during school hours or um, in the evenings of those weekdays. Up to six mid-size events with up to 100 attendees were analyzed, and those would occur on weekdays in the afternoon and evening and then up to four small events with up to 35 attendees during school hours or on weekday evenings. Here's the proposed site plan, which shows um, the buildings are mostly in the same location as where the existing development is on site today. So it's in this <coughs> northern portion. The ball field is down here, and then we have the pond over on that side. And here's the southern, that was the northern site, and this is the southern side of the site plan. So you can see the southern side is uh, relatively left as is. This is a rendering of one of the buildings. Um, this is the classroom school building. Um, and they have been designed to blend into the landscape with, on that parcel. And the other two buildings are very similar in design. An NOP, an initial study, and an environmental impact report were completed consistent with the California Environmental Quality Act, or CEQA. Uh, when staff presented at the draft EIR at the Planning Commission hearing, uh, we received no public comments. A total of six comment letters on the draft EIR were received by federal, state, and local agencies. And county and staff and the EIR consultant have reviewed all of those comments. Those comments focused on transportation, utilities, wildlife, and then site remediation for the soils. We've made minor modifications to the draft EIR text in response to those comments, as shown in section three of the final EIR. This project would result in three significant and unavoidable impacts. Those, those impacts are the steady intersections under the existing plus project conditions, so all three of these are traffic study intersections under cumulative plus project with the village at Loomis conditions, and then study intersections under cumulative plus project without the village of Loomis conditions. Overall, um, I'll summarize these impacts. Even with mitigation, because these transportation related impacts are outside of our county's jurisdiction, uh, we cannot guarantee that they will occur. Impacts to the intersections within the town of Loomis jurisdiction would remain significant and unavoidable because many of the improvements are only partially funded by the town of Loomis's CIP fee program, and it cannot be guaranteed that the village of Loomis project will install the necessary improvements. So because of those facts, the county cannot guarantee that the improvements would be completed, and the EIR declares these as significant and unavoidable. Even with these three impacts, staff does support the minor use permit for this project. The proposed use has been conditioned to construct physical improvements to the local roadways. Uh, they're incorporating the use of shuttle buses for the students for transportation to control the number of trips to and from the school. 
and the project would pay its applicable Sparta or South Placer Regional Transportation Authority fees. The project is consistent with the land use designation and zone district, as well as with surrounding land uses. And the school, the tribal education center, and the cultural center are consistent with uses allowed with a minor use permit in the RA zone district, uses such as elementary and secondary school, community center, and museum. Issues like noise and light for the neighboring uh, subdivision have been addressed in the IR and would be less than significant. Additionally, the proposed uses are less intensive than the former uses on the site, like the event center. Overall, the project is consistent with the general plan, the zoning ordinance, and the community plan. And it would not be detrimental to the health, safety, and general welfare of the people residing or working in that area. This is just to show a little more detail on um, some of those road construction improvements that the project would complete. And this is an intersection at the uh, Taylor Road and Penryn Road. So this would be a signal, um, a traffic signal, and it's a split intersection. And um, the northbound Pen Road approach would need a right turn lane. And this would help control traffic for the project. The traffic study prepared for the project determined that this, uh, in, this impact would be significant at the intersection of Taylor and Penryn Road in the AM peak hour, but I will note that the intersection currently operates unacceptably already. As I said before, we presented this item as an informational item to the Horseshoe Bar Penryn MAC in summer of 2017. Uh, there was no opposition at the MAC, only a show of support. And due to the MAC schedule and the fact that there was no opposition, um, the MAC did not request the item to return as an action item. So we recommend that uh, your commission certify the UAIC school project final EIR. Um, prepared pursuant to the MMRP and the findings of fact and statement of overriding considerations, and to approve the minor use permit for the private pre-K through eighth grade school, the education center, and the cultural center. Um, I will also note that we prepared an errata to clarify and slightly revise some of the conditions in the last couple days just to um, better match the MMRP. And there are a couple copies over there too. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Tiffany Wilson with RSC Engineering applicant representing the United Auburn Indian Community, UAIC. Um, this project's been going on for quite some time, it takes a while to get through the EIR process. We've been working closely with staff and the EIR consultant during this time to get to a point where we are here. Um, we uh, approve the um, conditions and we are hoping you guys will approve the project. Um, we have representatives from the tribe here, and we're here to answer any technical questions if you have them. Go right ahead. Thank you. Um, I have a couple questions, I think, related to start and end times. I know that this is very close to Del Oro High School, and with that in consideration with the traffic, part of my question is, have you guys considered starting and ending times of the school so that it'll they're, they aren't compounding the traffic issues in that community. Well, so we, that's what the traffic, you know, tr study analyzed. Um, we did look at that as an alternative, but it just makes it you're you're either too too late or too early because um, Del Oro is right at the kind of standard eight o'clock time. Um, staff does arrive a little bit earlier and the students will be coming in via shuttle. I do want to point out the traffic study had to assume the tribal school may not be there in the future so it actually is analyzing based on individual vehicles coming 
whereas the school will be using a shuttle system, so there will actually be less traffic while the school is in um, operation. Okay. So this, are, are you planning to having the school start at the same time as Del Oro? Is that, is that part of the plan? I don't think it's right at the same time. No. Okay. I just thought about the starting end time might help address that. And then my second question is, um, you know, it can be frustrating driving past schools sometimes because you have cars lined up out on the street at certain times. And so considering a clear plan for car pathway and parking as they enter schools during the day, I think is an important part of addressing this, this unmitigated issue here. Um, and so having a clear drive in and drive out plan for the school uh, would be helpful. So again, so their intent is to have mostly shuttles. I believe there's like eight shuttles that come from various directions. And there is a long throat depth off of Taylor before you get to the school where the unloading zone is. So most of those vehicles, the intent is they'll be on site. They're not going to be sitting on Taylor waiting to make a right or a left in. Any other questions? Comments? Thank you very much. Thank you. Open it up for the public. Would the chair like to put a uh, time restriction on the public comment portion? Um, absolutely, thank you. Um, comments will be restricted to, to three minutes. The timer will be going. Um, you'll get a yellow light when you have about a minute left, and that would be time to, to start wrapping up your thoughts, if you could, please. Thank you. Um, hello. Good morning, Planning Commissioners. I'm Patty Neifer. And I'm the current chair of the Penryn Horseshoe Bar MAC, which encompasses the area that the tribal school is proposed for. Um, I was also the chair at the July um, 2017 meeting when there was public comment. Um, I just want to note that the tribe came to the community, not only to the MAC, but to the community very early in the process to request input. And, um, from then to now, there, there have been no uh, negative comments from the community. Uh, you know, the, the, the site was an um, event center in the past, and that could very well have had events every single weekend, and I attended some of those <laughs> events. So a school is something that is very um, embraced by the community. Um, the, the entire process and the, the, the planning including parking and including uh, um, the limited number of events on site have, have been embraced. And then also fitting into the natural environment is something that um, I wasn't even aware of until I saw the, the plans here. That's all very, very positive. So um, the community comments um, at the MAC and in general as a private individual have been very positive. So we're very supportive um, of the the tribal school. Um, our fire department has already done limited events with the school, and um, I'm a volunteer for the Penryn um, Fire Protection District. Um, so it's something that's very uh, positive for the entire community, and I just wanted to stress that. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Danielle Hardesty. I'm a member of the um, Penryn Fire Board, and I'm just here to reiterate our Penryn Fire support of this school district. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Kelly Warden. I'm a resident um, right next to the property that the proposed school is located. I work for a school district. I'm in big support of this school. However, I am concerned about the lighting on the fields. Um, our local softball field was not able to put lights up because of the brightness that it glows in the sky and in our neighborhood. Um, and then my also concern is that I received a letter saying that there was going to be um, serve up to 100 students with a staff of 35 members. And the presentation said 43 members. Um, I just want to hope that the higher number is the number that will be in play and not the lower one because the staff to student ratio would be 
much more acceptable at a higher rate. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to address? All right, seeing none, we'll close this portion of the meeting and uh, bring it back to the commissioners. Comment, discussion, motion? No question. Question? I'm wondering uh, where the uh, where the unavoidable uh, uh, traffic issues in the city of Loomis are uh, not able to be handled by the county. What's the, I, this is a process question? Is what's the normal procedure where obviously <coughs> we're not expecting Loomis to uh, cover the total cost of whatever they do? Is it? So. How does the county normally handle this? Um, I can speak to that. Um, Sarah Gilmore, Engineering and Surveying, and I work with DPW on this question. Um, so there is an MOU um, that's uh, unique to Placer County's relationship with the city or town of Loomis, um, whereas the town does not want to participate, as some other jurisdictions do, with the overall county CIP program. So they want to kind of do it their own way. And um, the agreement is that if the town's going to do that, they, they keep all the money they collect, and everybody outside the town keeps all the money they collect, and we'll deal with our respective impacts on our own. Kind of like a mirror like bounces back at either side. Okay, so this is a determination that you make later? Determination that, as no. As so there's an MOU that, that says we don't, we, don't, we don't all participate in one big CIP like much of the county and cities do. Um, town deals with their own issues internally and collects their own fee program. And in this case, um, to be honest, uh, they don't fully, they haven't fully funded the intersections that were impacted here. So they're not collecting from? They're not collecting from us. We don't collect from them. But you are? We collect for, for our own intersections um, with our own CIP that studies all the intersections in unincorporated Placer County. Well, so there's no collection then that's going to uh, share with Loomis in? No, there is. That is what the MOU is that we don't share. But what's that now? The MOU is that we don't share. That you don't share? We don't. We, they, they have their own CIP program okay. for their own intersections. Okay. Like a bubble. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, sorry, it's kind of overarching. If there was someone from DPW, they could probably get into the nitty gritty of all that. But. Hey, your microphone's not real. Oh, clear. I'm sorry. I'll yeah. lean forward next time. Um, any, any more clarifications on that question? No, I think that answers it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Any other questions? We have a motion to be made. Oh, let me see. We have, I'll make the motion that we certify the uh, UAIC school project final environmental impact statement <coughs> report. Uh, prepared and pursuant to the California Environmental Quality Act and adopt the mitigation monitoring reporting program supported by and incorporated by reference in its entirety and the findings of fact statement of override consideration as uh, reported in the stat report. Can we include the uh, errata in there also? We have an errata too. Or is that just that the errata is not needed for the EIR portion just, just of for the, the, but it would be needed for the second portion of the motion. Minor. Okay, thank you. Do we have a motion? Do we have a second? Mm -hmm. A motion and a second. Roll call, please. Sir. We had a first from Mr. Johnson and a second from Mr. Sevison. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Correct. So a vote from Mr. Cannon. Yes. Mr. Herzog. Yes. Mr. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Nader. Yes. Mr. Hauke. Yes. Mr. Sevison. Yes. Mr. Moss. Yes. Thank you. All right, so now we need a, a separate motion for the uh, minor use permit. I'll go ahead and move to to make or, uh, to approve the minor use permit for a private pre-K through eighth grade school facility in the RA Zoni District facility, a tribal education center, and a tribal cultural center supported by the findings contained in the staff report and subject to the conditions of approval. Second. And then the motion would also need to include uh, subject to the errata conditions of approval. Yeah, well. subject to the errata conditions of approval. Yes. Motion and a second? I'll second that with that amendment. 
I have a motion by uh, Mr. Herzog and a second by Mr. Cannon. And if I could have everyone lean into their mics maybe a little bit more. I don't know how you're projecting out to the audience, but it's quiet um, from my perspective. Um, so, Mr. Cannon, could I have a vote, please? Yes. Mr. Herzog? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Nader? Yes. Mr. Hauge? Yes. Mr. Sevison? Yes. Mr. Moss? Yes. Thank you. Your rights. All right. Thank you very much. That brings us up to our 1025 item. Are you going to have an appeal? Oh, what appeal? I guess that's true. Thank you. Um, anybody wishing to appeal this decision may do so within, I think it's 10 calendar days, by paying a fee of $602. All right, next up is the Seven Cedars Minor Land Division Third Party Appeal of Zoning Administrator's Approval of a Parcel Modification. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. I'm Bennett Smith Art with the Planning Services Division. Uh, the next item is a appeal filed by Mr. John Masha on the Zoning Administrator's October 18th Approval of a Parcel Map Modification to update the location of the 100-year floodplain and the riparian protection area on the parcel map information sheet. The subject parcel is located on Seven Cedars Drive in Granite Bay. The parcel is zoned residential agriculture, combining a minimum building site of 100,000 square feet. The topography on the 2.8-acre parcel is generally flat. The site slopes 2.6% down to Linda Creek. There's a single family dwellings to the east, the west, the south, and there's an agriculture facility to the north. The site is developed with a 4,800 square foot single family dwelling, patio, pool, and driveway. The property has an 18 year history of code enforcement violations. That includes storage of materials in a riparian area, grading and placing fill within the floodplain, and unlawful, unlawful land use. These previous code enforcement cases were closed as of August 4th, 2016. There is one open code enforcement case on this property. The current property owner has constructed an open right iron fence located 100 feet south of the center line of Linda Creek, which is currently within the depicted riparian protection area on the parcel map information sheet. Approval of this parcel map modification will correct this code enforcement action. At the October 18th zoning administrator hearing, the applicant requested approval of a parcel map modification to update the location of the 100 year floodplain and riparian protection area on the parcel map information sheet with current field data. The process under the subdivision map act allows for corrections to the final map as long as the corrections do not impose any additional burden on the present fee owners of real property and do not alter any right, title, or interest in the real property reflected on the recorded map. The public hearing process is limited to the modification only. First is the 100-year floodplain. The, the floodplain modification request is update the 100-year floodplain limit on parcel one based on the recently completed floodplain study now recognized by FEMA. This study places the base flood elevation for parcel one about one foot lower than the earlier draft study used in 1999. An on-site field survey dated September 28, 2018 was completed by CNA Engineering. If you take a look at the map, um, the, it adjusted a little bit. The blue line right here is, is the current floodplain and it's adjusting to this area. This is the corrected floodplain right here. So next to the riparian protection area. The applicant is requesting to clarify the riparian protection area shown on the July 1999 parcel map information sheet. Studies were completed by Marcus H. Boyle and Associates in 2002 and 2004 and they were updated in 2016. As a part of a provided to the county as a part of previous code enforcement actions determined that existing riparian 
habitat was located approximately 50 to 70 feet from the center line of Linda Creek. This is the, the map of the riparian area provided by Marcus H. Boyle and Associates. Um, so the top line right here is the center line of, of Linda Creek. Uh, the meandering line just underneath it is the extent of the riparian habitat. So all the riparian habitat is within here. And they are requesting um, to modify it to 100 feet from the banks of the creek. So within that 100 feet is all riparian area. The Zoning Administrator approved the parcel map modification on October 18th ZA hearing. John Masha spoke in opposition to the modification, citing concerns of illegal past grading activities. The Zoning Administrator discussed the possibility of some fill that might remain from past activities and determined that the fill was substantially removed from the property and any remaining fill would be an insignificant amount that now would, would not impact neighbors in the floodplain. On October 26, 2018, an appeal was filed by Mr. John Masha. The letter of appeal includes the following comments. Each of these comments are followed with staff's response. One, the zoning administrator did not consider evidence showing that flood elevation changed from illegal activity. The evidence that the appellant submitted shows past activities and did not show current conditions. The following slides will show before and after photographs of the site. We will go into these details shortly. Now to number two, the proposed modification to the parcel map would cause a decline in property value and would violate his property rights. No information has been submitted to Placer County staff by a qualified real estate appraiser or similar professional in this regard. Further, it should be noted that the subject has no viewscape easement or any other legal real property encumbrance upon it that would assert a right to Mr. Masha's property. The statement is unsubstantiated. Three, approval of this map modification encourages illegal fill activity and sets a precedent for grading activities in the floodplain. This Past illegal grading activities were a part of several code enforcement cases. The past property owner was ordered to pay a fine and remove items in the floodplain. Corrective measures occurred and the code enforcement case was accordingly closed upon the completion of the requisite remediation. Approval of the parcel map modification therefore does not set a precedent for grading in the floodplain as the prior grading violations have been appropriately abated. So we come back to comment one, which was the zoning administrator did not consider evidence showing that the floodplain, um, the flood elevation changed from illegal activities. During the hearing, the appellant mentioned that three feet of fill remained in the floodplain, and the difference between the new survey and the old survey is the illegal fill. These photographs on the slideshow show the previous piles of dirt with the, the large red area, so right here and right here. Um, that the preceding property owner created. These photographs dated 2018, 2008 and 2014 show piles of dirt placed in areas defined as floodplain on the current parcel map information seat. Next, these photographs show current conditions, no visually identifiable uh, piles of dirt. The photograph on the left hand has a tape measure extending to three feet for reference. Also, the root flares of these trees are visible in these photographs. The root flare is the base of the tree at natural conditions. The applicant provided a new contour interval survey of the site to staff. This new site survey indicates that current conditions are near natural conditions as mapped in 1999. My colleagues in engineering and survey can speak in more detail about the map if needed. To further validate the above similar similarities, county staff conducted a brief on-site soil push probe survey. General findings from the push probe survey supported the November 2018 CNA survey and that little evidence of fill was encountered and where fill was noted, the depths and limits of such were minimum. 
Therefore, the Development Review Committee recommends the Planning Commission deny the appeal by Mr. John Masha, find the project categorically exempt from CEQA, Section 15305 Minor alter Alterations to Land Use Limitation, and uphold the Zoning Administrator's decision to approve the parcel map modification supported by the findings and staff report. My colleagues from ESD and I are available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Any any questions? Yeah. Do we know where the soil came from that got put there illegally? Was it part of a house construction, or how did it how did it arise on site? Uh, in regards to the uh, the previous, uh, I'm not sure what his use of of the the previous dirt was. Uh, it might have been associated with a business. There was a le um, illegal land use out on the site involving, I believe, a, 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 a business previously. So it might have been associated with some business activities of the previous property owner. So it was, it was probably brought on site and it wasn't just moved around from place to place on site. Is that what yes, yes, it was brought on site. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> I see the staff report talked about a steel fence. What is that in between the old line and the new line? The uh, the, the the fence in question, the wrought iron fence. Yeah. Well, was it, can you repeat your question? I'm sorry. Well, is is that fence in between the old uh, contour for the uh, zone versus the new one that's been proposed? Uh, so so it's within the riparian protection area. So it's a hundred feet. The new fence now is a hundred feet from the center line. Of the creek, so it's right at the, the edge of the riparian area. So when the riparian area gets adjusted, it'll be just on the other side, and they'll be able to to keep the fence. So it's not uh, it's inside of the uh, hundred year floodplain. Uh, as it stands, yes, and right, it will right remain. If and it will can't... remain in the floodplain. It will not remain in the riparian area. Okay. Then uh, now, apparently, we have a new property owner. Yes, yes, a new property owner. How long have they lived in this site? I believe it was, uh, they moved in around, or they purchased the property around 2016. Okay. I don't have the exact date. Okay, that's close enough. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, there was also concern about the hazardous conditions, uh, several comments about that. I, I read the responses to that. Do you have any update on that um, at this point? Uh, from from ha hazardous materials from mm -hmm. from past activities. Yeah. Um, so our environmental health department uh, did go out on site and do an analysis, and they did not see anything that would warrant any more um, further uh, research or survey on site for hazardous mm -hmm. materials. Anything else? Okay, I think now procedurally we would hear from the, the appellant next. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Thank you. The, uh, the chair is also free to set the amount of time um, for the appellant and uh, any public comment afterwards. Okay. Um, Mr. March, can you think you can limit your, you, you think you can make your presentation in, in five minutes? No, sir. No. The, I have enough evidence. It takes all day if I went through all of them. Okay. Well, wait, I'll yeah, tell you right least, now, you're not getting all day. I know. I know. Um, but and, and, I, can and I think we much, need to, we need yeah. to limit the comments to the specific items that you have appealed. We've had a good history of the project here, and and so so specifically to the the, the specific items that you addressed in your appeal, we would yes. like to limit the comments to that. Yes, I do the best I can. Thank you. First, I want to go Chair, through. just for reference, uh, staff's report took ten minutes. That um, then let's minutes. let's let's keep it even then and, and, and give you ten minutes and and like I say, try to keep it specifically to the items that you are appealing. <clears throat> I just wanted to go through the pictures. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. 
let's let's go through the history of this project. This place, for 18 years, this place was used as an automobile chop shop. Um, construction, construction stage in ground, and uh, the previous owner, as you can see, they brought the dirt in. They didn't bring a lot of dirt all at once. The, the first time they brought the dirt was in 2000. Uh, let's, I, I handed out uh, some handouts for you to look at. I just want to prove that if you look at the handouts that you got on, on, on the top, um, let's start with where it says on the top right hand corner, num item of page number four on a red mark. It says July 22nd, 2004. This is a letter from Art Davidson, who is a Placer County engineering uh, technician who visited the site. And I yellow highlighted for you. It says, I reviewed the grading activity on this subject property. During that review, extensive grading activities was observed. So they started from 2003, really. They brought dirt into increments. They didn't bring a whole bunch of dirt all at one time. So, and then you can see on, um, and then they brought the dirt and they leveled it and then covered it with barks. And then um, they had to do that because this place was a marshland. He was using it to bring the heavy equipment trucks and they would sink in. So they brought the dirts in and um, this is just a sample of the pictures that I have that they brought the dirts in. And this is just a tip of iceberg. I have document every year how much dirt they brought in and they leveled. Mr. Marsh, in fairness to the limited amount of time you have, I don't think anybody was denying that dirt okay. was brought All in, right. but we've also been told the dirt was removed. Do you no, have that's evidence? That's what I'm that getting Okay, let's, that's what let's I'm jump getting to at. that. Uh, if you let's could, put the video. Are we ready for the video? Uh, the video. Let's go ahead and show the video here, and then I'm going to get played. Yeah, let's play. Yeah, you can see they brought the dirt, and this is I happen to observe it that they I haven't I'm not there all the time, but they would bring the dirt to the tractor, and they would right there where you see is the the peri and protected area is, and they brought the dirt. And well, anyhow, let's let's get to the point as you indicated. Uh, these handouts that I give you, I want to prove to you that the dirt that bribing was never moved. Not even one shovel of it was moved. And is, this is not true, gentlemen. If, if this, any dirt was removed, I wouldn't notice it. I have witnesses and everything. Now, to prove that, you can see the handout I just passed to you. Just look at it very briefly. On the top corner that says circle with number one, it's a letter to, just happened to be the zoning administrator, Mr. George Rosasco. It says right on the bottom where I yellowed it, the ongoing flood plain, uh, Mr. Johnson has placed fill and he expanded his chop shop. I'm bringing him to his attention that the dirt is being brought in here. Now, let's go briefly to number two on the right hand corner the letter of March 15, 2016, to, to Supervisor Kirk Euler. Right on the bottom of the page, item number one, there are nearly three feet of field material that has illegally placed inside repair and protect must be removed. By March 15, 2016, nothing has removed, and I brought it to their attention. Would you go to... The number, uh, the letter number three, where on the right-hand corner says number three. 
to Mr. Wesley Zicker is the director of uh, the director. I wrote a letter. And then it says, Mr. Johnson went to the court, the court enforcement took him to the court, and he pleaded guilty and removed the personal item. But I would specifically ask him, he must remove the, the dirt that he brought in, but the dirt wasn't removed. Now let's go to one more time, Mr. Tim Wagner, this code enforcement supervisor, where it says number five on top of the page, right-hand corner. To Mr. Tim Wagner, up to October 2004. To, I'm sorry, October 24, 2007. It says, Mr. Tim Wagner, up the, the dirt, I yellowed it for you to quickly look at it. The dirt that has been brought in, up to two to three feet of dirt that has been placed on a floodplain during the past six years, and is it still using as a road. That, has, that must be removed. So, and then we go to the, where it says number six on the corner, which is recent complaint, I have a specific said that the three feet of dirt that has been brought there and is level. Yes, the ruling came from the, uh, and then he paid fine. They removed the personal property, the trucks, the equipment, but they never removed any dirt. So the, the the pictures that we were shown by, by county staff that showed the base of the tree being level with, with the natural pavement, Yes, those are inaccurate? Well, the dirt was not placed evenly, three feet evenly. Maybe around the trees they put very little, but where, where, is, was, where the dirt was placed was around here. You can see around here they brought in and they brought and then specifically right in front of those tents. Let me see if I can have a picture uh, of the tents. You see the tents on the, uh, on the upper corner? Around that area is where the most dirt was placed. On the side that they say the trees are exposed, I live next to that. I see what's happening there. Yeah, maybe a little bit of roots are shown, which I haven't seen it. But, but most of the dirt was placed on the other side and in the middle here um, on that area. And as a result of this illegal grading, they blocked the drainage and all the drainage with all the contaminants comes to my property and it's still going towards the creek. So for the, for the past 18 years, 16 years of it, I've been consistently, there have been numerous code enforcement violations and reports and I have consistently said there is a dirt there. Supervisor Euler, you take anybody in Placer County. Um, Mr. E.J. Ivaldi, Supervisor Kirk Euler, um, Wes Zicker, Dan Dautai, they've all been aware of what's happening in there. But honestly speaking, there has, when they say this dirt is removed, is an insult to me and is an insult to the whole community. Nothing was removed. Now, would you ask the staff here what evidence they have that this dirt was removed? And I accept it. I think they've told us what, what efforts they've went through, but go ahead and finish with your presentation, yeah. please. And I then, don't want you to run out of time. And, and I also want to be able, have the opportunity to debut if something they say that I have evidence against it. But anyhow, the dirt was not removed, and if... Now, what is the purpose of this map modification? They already have an existing fam, a single family unit there, plus an accessory unit um, called mother-in-law quarter. Now, the other issue is the property values. Yes, I have spoken to professional appraisers and uh, real estate professionals. It definitely uh, affects the, uh, the value of my property. And my property rights I violated. When I purchased this property, I purchased it with the openness of space next door. I didn't anticipate a map change or anything like that. And now they're changing, they want to change things on me and that's quite unfair. 
Um, so I, 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 could have, I could have presented the evidence for property value. One more thing I will say since you're cutting me. There is an email from Mr. Rick Erie, was previous deputy um, director. He said in an in a email, which is right here, I can present to you. I have submitted it to the staff. He said, if the map change is going to go through, it must be the property rights of the, uh, the whole map, like my parcel, and they've got to be protected, which is not. My property rights are not protected. Okay, thank if you. If you have any questions, let me know. Have... Questions? Apparently not. Thank you very much. Yeah, we if there's something comes up we'll we'll call you back up. Um I guess it would probably be appropriate. Is there a representative of the property owner present? Good morning, members of the commission. My name is Steve Norman. I'm with CNA Engineering. We're the uh, engineering firm that was hired to go out and check everything out there, basically. Um, Anna Cave is the licensed surveyor in my office. She's a project manager. She can speak more specifically to any detail stuff. Um, but I'm here to just to real simply say we were hired to go topo that land to see what the real deal is, what where the fill is, so we could present to the planning staff the conditions, all of the discussions about uh, illegal fills, vehicles, that's all violations have all been taken care of by, by, the, by the new owner. As you can see, you have pictures of what it looks like now. It looks like a park out there now. It's beautiful, it's flat, grass is growing. I was out there personally. I could not see anywhere where there was fill. The, the, the trees were at grade. The, the, the roots of the trees, you could see them on the ground. So the, the testimony of Phil being there, I, I could not see any personally. After topoing the project, being out there twice with the field crew, the exhibits that you saw rep represent the maps that John Marsha did, contours, and the maps that we did, you know, in just last year. And they're relatively the same. The floodplain has changed, all, although because there's been new studies and the 100 year has been pushed closer to the creek. It's a different elevation. But the elevations of that land in that area by the topo we did independently are really close to what was shown on John's original 1999 map. So I, 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 don't, I don't know where that dirt is. I don't, so I just wanted to really reflect that to the, to the commission. So that seems to be the, most of the discussion is the dirt, and I don't know where it's at. Okay. Do you have any questions? Questions? Okay, I have a question. Yeah, he was talking about the... Uh, the slope of the property or something changed that causes drainage to come over his property, Mr. Moss's property. Did you observe that? No. Um, we can get real detailed and, and show you all the survey shots we took. Every single shot, we topoed the heck out of it. And everything's going to the creek. It all drains to the north. So. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Any other questions before you sit down? I guess you're good. Okay, is there any members of the public that would like to speak? That would be time. Okay. Seeing none, um, we'll bring it back to the commission. Oh. I'm also authorized in writing to speak you know, on behalf of two neighbors who are on, out of the state and they are not they have not been here. One is Mr. Joe Sorello. He wrote a letter and he expressed he was a, one of the witnesses that the dirt was brought in and he wanted to come and t speak to the commissioners, but he is out of town and he has given me a letter that I could speak on his behalf. I don't think anybody's disputing the fact that dirt was brought in. Yes. I don't think anybody has tried to dispute the fact that dirt was brought in at all. Yeah. And then. Mr. Norman just said that as a result of grading, the, the drainage does not come to my property. Uh, the owner is here, Mr. Um, Morehouse. I can show the pictures that shows uh, on my boundary line, like the water coming like a, like a creek. You can see the water uh, 
I will come in and write, standing is still and until it fills up and then it goes adjacent. I have pictures of that in there. If I have time, I could show you that the water was diverted to, into my property. There are pictures showing that. And, uh, and as, of, as we speak, even last Sunday, I took a picture, if you're willing to look at it, that the water is diverted into my property as a result of the illegal grading. Um, and Mr. Was it Mr. Masha? Yes. Okay. You know, it, it seems like for 18 years you've been through just a heck of a deal with your yes, property. Yes, I have. I, property. It was. It, I wish I never bought this property. Yeah. I wish so, I, I never. We never got the use. Uh, we weren't happy there. Mm -hmm. Every day, you can see every day something is happening. Right. Mr. Morehouse bought. He is a very fine gentleman. He went before he purchase the place, I disclose everything to the real estate agent. And as a result, real estate agent introduced me to him. We, I disclosed everything to Mr. Morehouse that what's happening. He, he came to our house and promised me and my wife that he will do it right. He will dig a ditch alongside the property so the water wouldn't come inside my property. And he would be living there. He would move there and live there and would be sitting and having a beer together and I was happy and we were dropping it. We just accepted it and I dropped everything and for, wanted to forget about everything. But then when this map change come and the construction of the fence came in, that was quite surprising to us and contradictory to what he promised to us. And actually, he, Mr. Morehouse agreed to dig a ditch alongside the property. He even gave me a check to pay for the, I found a, a, a gentleman, a grader to come and, uh, he's here, he can testify to that, to dig the ditch. I, I spent time, find the contractor, reasonable. The moment I wanted to start it, he says, no, let's put it off. I just don't want to do it now. I still have the check and I still have, and the ditch has not even, Yet. Yeah, I, I, I hear that, and that seems like to me that's an issue that between property owners, what what this is dealing with is an appeal of a change of the hundred year floodplain now, what is, in the right you, might ask, you might ask, what is the purpose of changing the map? They already have the two residences there already. What what is the purpose of it? You just haven't I, I don't think that's an item of the appeal. <laughs> that's, yeah, there was, a new, uh, there was a new survey that happened. Yeah, but if you take the dirt out, there is, you see, this is not a rocket science. A, pro a professional, Mr. Uh, Norman comes here and says, well, I walked it, I didn't see any dirt. He hasn't seen 18, the, the owner, the previous owner was very clever. He would bring the dirt in as you saw the tractor as I said, he never brought the dirt in all at one time. It's been happening through, as I showed you the letter. It's been happening for 18 years. Yeah, he I would know. bring I... the dirt in, he would flatten it, and then he would cover it with bark. And then it started all over, doing the same thing. Now, how can that, and it's all, yes, it's all flattened right now. You don't see the pile of dirt, absolutely. But if you go out there right now, you can see the bark is all over there, where they covered everything. And it's not a rocket science. You can hire a professional soil engineer. They do test holes. They can tell you at what area where the, um, the, the field has been placed. Mm -hmm. now, I, if, I, I, I hear you, and you keep repeating yourself, but basically we understand that you've been through a, a heck of a ride for the last 18 years. Yeah. But in your appeal... Why are you appealing a change in the 100-year uh, floodplain? Because this is how we purchased the property. I purchased <coughs> the property based on what the map is, open space next to me. Mr. Morehouse or previous owner, when they purchased the property, we had to sign at the escrow company. This is what we are buying. It wasn't anything hidden. Here is the map. And by the way, the map says on the information sheet that absolutely no 
No, you couldn't even bring one shovel of dirt into the riparian protected area. But look and see how much dirt they brought in, all illegally inside the riparian protected area. The map okay. says you couldn't. Well, I, I, I'm through, I think. I, I yeah, say, thank you. Uh, I think we've captured your information. I think we've got it now. Thank you. Um, we'll close this off and bring it back to the commissioners. Um, can I say something? Please. Uh, I would echo uh, Rich's comments. I can't imagine living next to this uh, incredible eyesore for 18 years. But also, I would uh, absolutely be ecstatic, given what's now happened uh, with the new owner and how the property looks now. I, and I uh, very firmly believe the engineering company that did the survey work because they went back to the original maps of uh, when this was developed uh, and uh, what the grade levels were at that time. That's very specific. That's rock solid. We know that. And uh, uh, I guess full disclosure, I've done business with CNA before and found them very thorough uh, and a company of integrity. So I believe what they're saying and telling us that they, in comparison to, to the original development and today that there is no difference, no significant difference in the, uh, the grade of the soil. So um, I, I think that's a, that's a mood issue for me. I just don't see it. Okay. Comments from other commissioners? Well, if you look at the pictures in the back of our agenda, I haven't had an opportunity to go on site, but it certainly is a... It's on. Oh, I'm just going to get a little closer to the paper. Uh, it certainly looks like a park, and I, I think I agree with you, Wayne, that, you know, it's pretty hard to get nature back 100% after you've toyed with it uh, in a lot of cases. And I, but I think they've done a yeoman's job here of, of trying to accomplish what was there originally, and it looks, I think they've made it look pretty darn sanitary at this point. Thank you. Um, I would have to agree. I did take the opportunity to go out yesterday and walk the property. Um, what I witnessed was similar to what staff showed us, that the, the trees looked like there wasn't any evidence of fill around the basis of those, and it would be hard to fill between them to the levels we've been told without coming up against the trees and, and having evidence of that. Um, it's a very clean, nice property at this point of time. The other thing I, I noticed is that the engineer told us that the fill, even if it was there, was not what changed the floodplains. It was more conditions downstream and upstream that changed how the, how the floods you know, were occurring more so than any conditions on the property itself. And so I don't think we've seen any evidence that, that says otherwise. Um, on the items that have, have been contested here. Okay, maybe one more. Yep. Yeah. Okay. okay, yeah, I'd like to ask staff to, uh, one of the questions that Mr. Marshall brought up is that, uh, that, you know, why did they change the flood claim on the map? Because he bought it and, you know, that's the way it was. So we did hear from staff what, what's permissible in changing that map. And so maybe you could just repeat that for Mr. Marsha and the rest of us. Uh, and why is it permissible? Yes, good morning. Uh, Daniel Datai, Deputy Director with Engineering and Survey. I can speak to that topic. Uh, so in 1999, when the parcel map was created, there was preliminary information available, which Mr. Marsha used to map the floodplain at that time. Since that time, FEMA has come in and done a study, a conclusive study that uh, mapped the whole reach of that creek. That study was based, they have found based on the study that the flow elevation in the creek has dropped by about a foot. So that drop in the creek itself results in additional dry real estate, if you will, to this property, Mr. Mosh's property, and the others out there as well. So that change in floodplain was based on the FEMA study. That FEMA study was published. There is a public comment period for that study. No uh, opposition was tendered at the time they adopted that study. And we're not aware that anything is incorrect in that study. So the floodplain change is a result of a one foot change in elevation in the creek, not necessarily from fill, as far as we can tell. 
Mm -hmm. And is there a specific rule that gives the county authority to change the map? So you have to remember that the floodplain itself has changed already by virtue of the FEMA floodplain study. The county recognizes that your commission is being asked to change the line on the map to more appropriately coincide and show where the accurate floodplain now is. Mm -hmm. So you're not really changing the floodplain. You're just changing, being asked to change a line on the map. And that's perfectly permissible under the county's regulations. Correct. You know, I mean, what, what specifically for Mr. Masha? He was saying that, uh, you know, he bought the map and this is the way it was, and now <laughs> we're talking about changing it. And it, so... The correction is allowed, actually, under the Subdivision Map Act. Okay. And the government code provisions are in the staff report. So you're saying it's the Subdivision Map Act that gives that permission? Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Dan, my question is, and I'm just maybe it's an assumption on my part, there is still a, an outstanding code enforcement issue related to the fence that's there. And because of this uh, line movement, uh, that will then uh, take care of the issue, the, of the code enforcement issue, because it will move that line back so that, that fence is no longer within that uh, sensitive area. Is that is that correct? Because that's really kind of the, would that be one of the motivations to move this so that the fence is not so an issue any longer? Uh, yes, Mr. Nader, that is correct. The request is to um, change the riparian <coughs> limits and the floodplain again, the floodplain to map what FEMA recognizes, and the fence then would be able to remain on a location if your commission approves those two changes. And the fence is an open iron fence and it is in the backwater area of a floodplain. So even if that did not change, there's many open iron fences within the floodplain in that reach. Uh, they're not considered a flood impediment because they're open iron. And then that, again, the code enforcement issue would go away. Correct. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? All right, um, we have a motion. Going the right way. Wrong way. The other way. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, I'd like to move. Uh, that we deny the appeal of Mr. John Marshall. We have a motion, second? Second. Motion and a second. Roll call, please, Sue. I have a first by Mr. Nader, second by Mr. Johnson. So a vote from Mr. Cannon, please. Yes. Mr. Herzog? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Nader? Yes. Mr. Hauge? Yes. Mr. Sevison? Yes. Mr. Moss? Yes. Thank you. I'd like to further move that we find the uh, project categorically exempt from the CEQA, section uh, 15305, uh, minor alter alterations to land use limitation. We have a motion, do we have a second? Second. Motion and a second, roll call please. First by Mr. Nader, second by Mr. Hauge, a vote from Mr. Cannon please. Yes. Mr. Herzog? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Nader? Yes. Mr. Hauke? Yes. Mr. Sevison? Yes. Mr. Moss? Yes. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to uh, further move, uh, uphold uh, the uh, zoning administrator's decision to approve the parcel map modification of PLN 18-00330, supported by the findings stated in the staff report. Do we have a motion? Do we have a second? Second. Motion and a second? Roll I have a... Call, please. Oh. Excuse me, uh, I have a first by Mr. Nader, a second by Mr. Cannon. So vote for Mr. Cannon. Yes. Mr. Herzog. Yes. Mr. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Nader. Yes. Mr. Hauke. Yes. Mr. Sevison. Yes. Mr. Moss. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so with that, the, uh, the appeal is formally denied. Is this an appealable to the board decision? Yes. Okay, Mr. Moss, if you are, are of so inclined you may appeal this decision to the board of supervisors within 10 days by paying a fee of 602 dollars and filling out the appropriate paperwork thank you uh, 
Um, how about we take a five minute break before we go to the next item?
draft environmental impact report, public review and comment. Thank you, Chairman and Commissioners. My name is Callie Kedinger Cecil with the Planning Services Division. The item before you today is to receive public comments on the draft environmental impact report for the Placer Retirement Residence Project located in Granite Bay. The purpose of today's meeting is to receive public comments. CEQA guidelines encourage and it is county policy to conduct public hearings on all projects for EIRs that are reviewed before the Planning Commission. The Planning Commission will ultimately be making a recommendation to the Board of Supervisors for consideration of the EIR and the project entitlements. This hearing reviews the adequacy of the draft EIR and is not an opportunity to debate the merits of the project. Public notification was conducted to inform the public of the availability of the draft EIR. Property owners within 300 feet of the property boundaries were provided legal notices, so that was 14 property owners. The notices were also sent to all the commenters who provided comments on the notice of preparation. Copies of the draft EIR are available at the Granite Bay Public Library, at the CEDRA and County Clerk's offices, and a copy was also provided to the Granite Bay MAC. The legal notice was published in the Sacramento Bee, and copies of the notice were provided to federal, state public agencies, school districts, and county staff. The project site is located in the island area of Granite Bay. The general project area is surrounded to the west, north, and east by the city of Roseville. The Sacramento County line is approximately 0.3 miles south of the project site, and the Placer County portion of the Woodbridge Estate subdivision is south of the project site. The project site is shown here in red. It's 8.7 acres bound to the south by Old Auburn Road and to the east by Sierra College Boulevard. These photos uh, are examples of the site itself. Uh, this photo was taken from the site of Sierra College Boulevard and this was taken from the intersection of Sierra College Boulevard and Old Auburn Road. What these photos show are the interior of the site as well as the existing vegetation that is along the roadway there. The site is undeveloped and existing vegetation is annual grassland, ruderal vegetation, and valley foothill riparian. The site is gently rolling and contains several native oak species that are along the project's southern and eastern boundaries that are near the Linda Creek Tree Lake Tributary. The project proposes a residential care home for seniors uh, with 145 congregate living suites and an approximate building footprint of 51,000 square feet. Additional site development includes uh, the construction of 101 parking spaces, grading, landscaping, bioretention areas, frontage improvements, and circulation areas. The proposed residential care home would consist of three stories with a total height of 34 feet and four inches. It would be accessed at the southeast portion uh, by a driveway extending from Old Auburn Road, and a gated EVA is proposed northeast of the building and would connect with Sierra College Boulevard. Hardscaping would include patios and walkways, and a trail would be constructed along the southern portion of the site and would cross the tributary with a bridge here. The project would be managed by two on-site teams who would, um, would reside on site. Uh, no medical care is proposed to be provided. Services that would be provided include uh, housekeeping services, linen services, meals, private van transportation, classes and activities. All utilities except private phone would be included with the monthly rent. The facility would employ approximately 30 persons with 18 full-time staff. Based on information uh, from facilities operated by the same applicant, the facility would have a population of 160 residents. Proposed frontage improvements would be to Old Auburn Road and include an on-site multi-use trail, curb gutter and sidewalk improvements, class two bike trail, and widening improvements. These proposed improvements deviate from the Granite Bay Community Plan. Both were analyzed uh, throughout the EIR, and the EIR concludes that the proposed with the modified frontage improvements would have fewer impacts to resources. The project is requesting a rezone from residential single family, combining agriculture, combining minimum building site, to residential agriculture, combining minimum building site of 100,000 square feet. The project is also requesting approval of a minor use permit for the construction and operation of a residential care facility with seven or more clients within the residential agriculture zone district. 
This project uh, was prevented to, presented to the Granite Bay MAC as an information item on November 2nd, 2016. The notice of preparation public comment period was from October 17th, 2017 and lasted in, until November 17th, 2017. The public review comment period for the draft environmental impact report opened on December 20th, 2018 and closes on February 4th of next month. Comments, re <clears throat> comments received during the NOP public comment period were from members of the public as well as Defend Granite Bay, the Granite Bay Community Association, the City of Roseville, and the Native American Heritage Commission. Comments uh, from the public were primarily concerned with aesthetics, land use compatibility, community plan consistency, aesthetic impacts, impacts to natural resources, traffic demands, and demands on public services. 14 resource areas were analyzed in the draft EIR. They are shown here and included an impact analysis to items such as aesthetics, public services, noise, biological resources, and transportation. The draft EIR determined uh, no impacts or less than significant impacts to greenhouse gas emissions, land use planning, <coughs> noise, public services, transportation and traffic, and energy conservation. Uh, impacts to aesthetics, air quality, biological resources, geology and soils, hydrology and water quality require mitigation measures in order to reduce those impacts to less than significant. The draft EIR determined that the project with the modified frontage improvements would not have significant unavoidable impacts. The, the draft EIR, however, concluded that if the full frontage uh, improvements are implemented, there would be significant unavoidable aesthetic impacts, both at a project level and cumulatively. The California Environmental Quality Act, or CEQA, requires that an EIR analyze a regional range of alternatives. Three alternatives are analyzed in the draft EIR and included no project, no build alternative, an existing zoning alternative to develop three single family residential lots, and a two story alternative. I would note that the first two alternatives do not meet any of the project objectives. The final alternative was based largely uh, from comments re received during the NOP public comment period for a desire to see the, the project be a two-story structure instead of a three. So the applicant uh, prepared renderings and site plans to evaluate this alternative. The draft EIR contains more renderings uh, from different angles than what is shown here on this slide. But what this is demonstrating is that the building mass of the proposed which is shown here in blue, versus the two-story alternative would actually be larger. Additionally, uh, this two-story alternative would require more earthwork that, that would require this large retaining wall, which is shown here in orange. So again, what this is showing is that though it would be lower, it would be lower by one and a half feet, the actual mass of the building uh, would be larger. To retain the project's feasibility, the two-story alternative would still have 145 units. A two-story alternative would require substantially more retaining walls, be closer to all property lines, have more impervious surface, and less area would be available for landscaping and retention areas. This is a site plan uh, that was prepared by the applicant that further demonstrates the differences between the proposed project and the alternative. Uh, the alternative is shown in yellow and the proposed is in blue. Again, this is just another way to show the differences between the alternative and the proposed three-story project. CEQA requires an environmentally superior alternative be selected uh, amongst all of the alternatives. The draft EIR determined that the no project, no build alternative was found to be environmentally superior. However, CEQA also allows that if the no project, no build is the environmentally superior alternative that another alternative may be chosen amongst the, amongst the alternatives to be the environmentally superior option. In this instance, the second alternative, the uh, build out to the existing zoning, would have the least environmental impacts and would have a reduction in all identified impact areas. <clears throat> However, this alternative would not meet any pro <clears throat> project objectives. In addition to today's meeting, there are several opportunities for public input. The county will be receiving comments until 5 p.m. on February 4th, and I will uh, be showing where those comments can be submitted at the end of the presentation. Any person who submits a, a written or oral comment will receive a formal response in the final EIR, and people can also uh, provide input at the Granite Bay MAC meeting, the Planning Commission hearing, and the Board of Supervisors hearing. I would also like to note that there is a court 
recorder here uh, to record all of the comments that we hear today. Uh, with that, I will end the presentation to allow for public comment unless the commissioners have additional questions. Thank you. Questions from the commission? I have one. Um, the Granite Bead Mac, did they have any comments when it came to them as an informational item? I'm sorry, can you repeat Did the that? Granite Bay Mac have comments when it came to them as an informational item two years ago? Yes, they did. Uh, they, they had comments that, that were largely regarding demands to public services. Uh, when this item went before the MAC, there, there had recently been a number of similar senior projects that, that had uh, recently been approved, and that is what I recall hearing the most from, from folks, was impacts to demands on public services. Any other comments or questions? Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. I guess it's appropriate to have a representative from the applicant. Any, any comments? No? Okay. Thank you. Um, we'll open it up to the public for comments. Um, we'll try to limit comments to three minutes. Watch the timer, please. And again, this is on not on the merits of the project, but on the ER itself. Oh, you just shot me down. <laughs> Sorry, Sandy. <laughs> uh, Sandy Harris, uh, Granite Bay. Um, I haven't had a chance to read this EIR. I've glanced at it because my community's been hit with three huge EIRs since the holidays, over the holidays. But uh, when this first came up, uh, we submitted, the Granite Bay Community Association submitted uh, to the first submittal comments and this has more to do with zoning because there's a big loophole in the zoning code for Placer County, and I hope that that's being addressed when we're updating the zoning code because by uh, rezoning this to what they've asked for, they can put this is an allowed use in that zone. And there are three, um, actually there would have been three lots there, and now we're going to have 160 residents there. And if this were in Roseville, they consider this a senior apartment type thing. That's why they haven't asked to have it brought into the city of Roseville. And it's in our little island there. And I hope that the, the planning staff in the county will look at that loophole. I did notice in the EIR, they have listed eight of these facilities. In Granite Bay, we have a population of 21,000 and our build-outs for about 23. And we have eight of these already, and that's, they didn't even put the one over on Sierra Ponds, plus at least 30 in individual <coughs> private homes that um, cater to seniors. So we're really un overloaded with this type facility, and it is overloading our fire district and our responses. But that's, that's my comments to now, because I haven't really had a chance to go over all this. Thank you, Sandy. You know, obviously, you can submit written comments up through the end of the, the comment period. Is there anybody else who would like to address the commission? Seeing none, we'll close this portion and bring it back to the commissioners. And I guess that's kind of it, is it not? Comments, yes. All right. Seeing none, we'll... Move forward to our 1130 item, the Placer Vineyard Specific Plan, First Development Phase, Property 1A Specific Plan, Amendment, Development Agreement, Small Lot Vestings, Tentative Subdivision Map. Good morning, Jennifer Bias, Planning Services Division, to present this item here. Placer Vineyard Specific Plan Amendment, Property 1A. The entitlements and requested action today will be to make a recommendation to the Board of Supervisors on the following actions. Uh, the certification or adoption of the addendum, addendum that's been prepared for this request. Approval of a specific plan amendment and development agreement amendment. <coughs> Approval of a, lo a small lot vesting tentative map and approval of an administrative modification. Just to get you in the context of where we are, West Placer County, 
Western Placer County. Uh, the plan area is shown in gray within the Dry Creek West Placer Community Plan area. Baseline Road is the northern border, border and Sutter Placer County line is the southern border for the plan area. The Placer Vineyard specific plan, as you all know, um, is in total 5,230 acres, approved in 2007, amended in 2015. This map is showing the current land use configuration that we've been implementing over the past three years. The total residential unit count that has approved today is 14,132 units. The specific plan provides comprehensive goals and policies for the development within this community plan area. In July, or excuse me, June of 2017, this commission approved the backbone phasing plan that defines all the development areas. They're shown in the highlighted green, yellow, and blue areas and green on the border for the first phase of development within the specific plan. These set the timings and triggers and obligations for all the property owners in this first phase of development. Um, and talks about the building and trigger obligations for each development. Bringing forward, we've approved multiple maps within the specific plan area. Mm -hmm. Today we'll be focusing on property 1A, but in total, we've mapped since 2017, 4,150 re residential units in this area. Property 1A is located in the far east corner of the plan area, bordered to the north by Baseline, to the east by Willerga Road, and a tributary to Dry Creek on the south. It's also zoned appropriately, which is Placer Vineyard specific plan land use. In the current approved plan, 2015, property 1A has assigned 930 residential low density units it's designed to be an active adult, which is 55 and plus. Also designed to be a private gated community. It was assigned 22 parkland acres, one religious site of approximately eight acres, and 88 acres of open space. And just noting that Town Center Drive and Ninth Street, which are internal to this subdivision, were both to be public streets but the rest of the streets that are being within this community would be considered private. So the specific plan amendment request, the first item we're gonna discuss is the religious to high density with adding additional units. Again, that would be adding 168 units, my little fly-in, um, on the religious site, what's now designated as the religious site, and this site plan is showing that would go to the brown color, which designates it high density residential, and it would increase the actual acreage by from eight to 9.7. This would add a total of, or this would increase the overall units to the plan area from our 14,132 to 14,300, and about add about 302 people to the total population. These Units are being requested to accommodate the affordable obligation required of each of the properties within Placer Vineyards. For recall, there is a development agreement with each of the 22 property owners within the plan area, and part of that development agreement is to provide on-site affordable units at a 10% of what the um, was required is what is required, and the breakdown of that is 2% moderate and 4% low and 4% very low. Staff does support this request for the change in the land use designation. Um, there's currently 72, 77 acres of mapped religious area within the overall plan area. Property 19, which is in our first phase of development, has already mapped a 20-acre site. And in addition to these religious sites designation areas in the plan, um, other land uses, including all the residential, commercial, and business park, would allow houses of worship under our current zoning. Can I ask a question, Jennifer? Sure. Um, when this was originally 
planned out. And obviously the requirement of 10% affordable housing within the whole project area. Uh, was there, within this particular 1A, was there a defined area of where that affordable housing was gonna be? Uh, or was it gonna be incorporated throughout the development? Or was there any plan at all at that? At that point, there was no land use area that specifically said, here's where the units would be assigned on this property. The development agreement just assigned 931 residential, and those were considered low-density residential units to this property. And then the development agreement then stated, and you're going to require a 10% affordability for the units, the low-density residential units. There was no specific, here is how you're going to do that. That's what each property has come forward with an affordable housing plan that will accommodate or talk about where these units would be provided. So that was an overall for the whole Placer Vineyard said, okay, you got to do 10%. And so that it could be concentrated in one part of, uh, of the development uh, that's completely outside of 1A. It could be, right? Well, actually, there's policies that said the unit should be spread amongst the plan area. So <laughs> we wouldn't want all of the units to be concentrated um, necessarily in one area of the whole plan. So we are trying to look at, as each of the 22 property owners come forward, how can they achieve meeting their on-site on -site affordables, which, which is really you know what the county's housing policies are getting at, getting actual built affordable units, With rather than trying to do alternative things like shift to another property or and or pay some fee. So you're saying each time they come in, like this one is coming in, you're right. saying, okay, what are you going to do to meet that requirement? And Correct. so basically they have to find that within their project. Yes, right? absolutely. So they can't lean on somebody else within the whole greater placer area <laughs> here. I mean, there's opportunity. They are not the only large property right. owner that, out there that does not have like a high density or commercial mixed use prop area assigned to their plan. So as each property comes forward, we'll have to evaluate the merits of where what they're proposing as their affordable obligation. This property owner is coming in and asking for this change to help serve and provide for that affordable requirement. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Um, as I was saying, staff does support this request. Um, the f units that are being assigned here would also be um, age restricted or 55 plus. So it would meet both a special needs housing goal as well as an affordable housing goal for the county. The second part of the amendment request would be Town Center Avenue and 9th Street. Currently has a roundabout that's proposed. Sorry, my little boxes got thrown off, but that blue area is a proposed to be a roundabout now, and they're coming in to propose an always stop. Um, staff supports this request as the level of service um, indicates that it is acceptable at either roundabout or an always stop and the design that accommodates uh, a gated facility they push the parkland back or are moving the parkland back and now have a row of residents so the design that will accommodate that we think will be satisfied with an always stop with a gate because to the south when you make the turning movement to the south off of Town Center Drive you'll be turning into a gated community. Trail, also the third request was a trail realignment. And this is uh, moving the class one bike trail along the eastern edge of the plan area to an internal location along 9th Street, proposed 9th Street, so. And staff does support this request also as it achieves the internal network of overall class one designs and keeps the circulation consistent. In addition, with the applications moving forward, um, there's a request for an administrative modification to realign the exhibit showing you that the current approved land use plan aligns the town center drive to the north of the religious site or the high density site. And they are requesting this admin mod that would move that location of the intersection down. Um, and that request is being made to comply with some avoidance that's required under their on-site federal permit. Um, a standard for approval for an admin modification is usually a planning director determination. And he looks at things like maintaining the goals and intent of the specific plan, not increasing units, 
um, keeping the overall circulation pattern. Um, the planner and director would generally support this request. One of the things that were, it would go forward because the realignment when the road moves down adjusts the road on property owner 1B and property owner 2. So we included this request so they could have the consideration for all of that in the package. Staff does support um, this requ request also. Real quick question. So are we amending then the other parcels and their plan at the same time to move that road? So the admin modification <clears throat> would, would change the land use plan for the overall plan area from this, which is seen on the left, to what's shown on the right. So that would move that line, that intersection, down to this location. Right. And it would adjust the road for 1A and it will basically be um, split between property two. It's a little hard to show on this exhibit, but the intersection, the roadway will come down and be between property two and 1A. Also proposed with this is a development agreement amendment. Recalling we have 22, 22 development agreements that are consistent um, approved today with the exception of an exhibit in the back of the development agreement that lists all the land use entitlements and a detailed land use for each property. So this development agreement amendment will change the land use exhibit, which is exhibit 2.2, I think, in the current development agreement, to update with the proposed land use units. And in addition, the development agreement's being amended to provide some options to satisfy active park acreage with the additional population, there was an additional park acreage requirement of 3.185 acres, and the additional population that's being served here is 637 people. The four options that are provided in the development agreement amendment would be adding the acreage to the overall fee program, adding additional amenities to parklands, paying an in-lieu fee equivalent, or dedicating more parkland. And so that's spelled out the options in the future as the project move forwards, how they achieve their parkland obligation. So the tentative vesting small lot subdivision map that's being requested here today would be for the 931 low density residential units plus the high density residential site. Included in that would be a density bonus that adds an additional additional units, so the total unit count would be 1,117 low density residential units. The density bonus request is being made because it's a special needs housing and they'll be doing deed restriction to 55 plus on all of the units and therefore they're entitled to a 20% density bonus under the state and county zoning ordinance. Amenities included are four private parks, one private recreation center, and six open space lots. We'll get into a little bit more. On the land use maps, all of the light yellow area is would be the low density residentials. Each area village has a private hood neighborhood park with one recre recreation center down um, to the south, and then quite a bit of open space. This area is to remain open space. Most of the other green open space will be drainage and open space. The red circles on the map are the gates proposed for entry onto the, into each village. Jennifer, I'm assuming those gates, it looks like those circles got shifted. It did look like they bit. got shifted, huh? Yeah, you got I, a gate in the open space. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry I, about I'm that. I'm assuming those are actually going at the intersections? <laughs> Correct. Okay. The tentative map does show the gates location correctly. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> On-site improvements. So phase one of this map will start at the eastern edge of the plan area. This is phase 1A and phase 1B coming off of Willerga Road and constructing the purple area shown on Town Center Drive. In addition, there'll be an emergency vehicle access that will come in off of <clears throat> baseline. Uh, the sewer line will be connecting to an existing connection for the first phase of development. And the water line will be coming down baseline road and that emergency vehicle access. Phase two is shown in the orange, additional improvements to baseline frontage. Phase three, or excuse me, phase two is the green, which is fully connecting the um, 
Town Center Drive, this southern village. Then phase three goes into the orange with improvements along baseline. Phase four continues the improvements along baseline. This is phase four over here. And phase five ultimately ends here with the purple and pink. I think it's more pink um, on my exhibit, but the creek, Placer Creek Drive. So I'm gonna pause here because Placer Creek Drive, we had some name changes out here. They've officially designated roads. And so Placer Creek Drive is formerly known as Dyer Lane in the plan area. So Placer Creek Drive will be constructed and the signalized intersection at baseline, this is known as Road 5A, I believe, and South, Tenor, South Town Center Drive, which has also been renamed to Town Center Avenue, um, will be constructed. Additional drainage improvements will be constructed within the open space. And the trail improvements and parks will all be built with each village that's constructed. There's also will be some sound walls along Baseline Road, Creek, Lasser Creek Road, the south side of <clears throat> Town Center Avenue, and wrapping right along this edge, there'll be a, a, a sound wall. Jennifer? <clears throat> Lot six uh, is down in the corner, right? That's where the, we're talking about the- uh, Lot six, right here. Right. That's gonna be where the uh, affordable housing is gonna be. It, it doesn't show any configuration of what that's gonna look like at this point. Is, is it because it's such a high density, they just say it's all gonna be filled in, but we don't know what it's gonna look like yet. So the high density within the all, all right. plan area has to come back through a site design review through the county to get its actual development entitlements. So that site would have to come back through the county for site design review, depending on if they do like a attached multifamily project, some kind of condo units, that would be all considered when they come forward with the project that they're proposing, they would have to meet the circulation, parking, all of those requirements would be discussed at that point. And I'm sorry, you went through the phasing of the project. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, where does lot six Lot six fits in at the phase three, I do believe. It will be available uh, at, at phase two. So let me take a step back. The timing and triggers for re the re requirements of the affordables are at 55% of the market rates. That site has to be available um, and entitlements have to be in to the county. And then at 70%, they have to be under construction. So there is conditions included in the map that require them to have that site with sewer access and then ultimate entitlements um, at a certain trigger. But the actual units wouldn't be ready until what you said, 70%? I think they have to have a construction obligation at, at 70%. 70%. I'd have to look That's at That's quite a ways down 70? the road on the project. 70%. Okay, and offsite improvements with this. Um, the first village phase will have um, connection to that um, existing sewer line, but then the second villages and beyond will have to connect to the overall offsite sewer plan. So they will have the offsite improvements to connect to the sewer and then overall offsite improvements that are consistent with the <clears throat> phasing plan and triggers within the phasing plan. Um, as you recall, a comprehensive environmental document, EIR, has been completed for this project that was done in 2006. There's an adopted mitigation monitoring reporting program that goes along with that. For this request, an addendum that is consistent with CEQA guidelines section 15164 has been prepared. Um, the preparation included a checklist that looked at all of the resource categories um, and looked for any kind of change conditions under this section of CEQA. The that would be a change to the project, change to a circumstance or new information. And what we determined was that there is no project specific significant effects that weren't identified in the previous EIR that would be substantially increased that would trigger a subsequent EIR to be performed with this requested amendment. 
Um, I do want to note that there was one change to the MMRP, and that's included in the package as attachment F, um, and that was to just clarify the additional park acreage um, on there. This item was presented at the West Placer MAC as an information and an action item um, on January 9th. The members of the MAC discussed the traffic questions regarding the changes from a religious site to residential units and had some concerns about two stories for senior citizens, but ultimately recommended a approval of a 3-0 vote. Um, in addition, and included, I believe Sue has provided to you, there was an errata with this project that would add a condition or add a letter under condition 113 to get an offer of dedication over lot landscape lot 2A. And that offer of dedication was being requested and was requested by property owner 2 to just, um, if in the future there is an access that would go south to property two, there would be the ability to connect and get access through that landscape lot. So with that, um, we're here. Our recommendation is to support the requested specific plan amendments, development agreements, adopt the addendum, a resolution approving the addendum. as provided to you in your staff report. Thank you, Jennifer. Questions? Um, Jennifer, I wanted to talk about the D restriction. Is it within lot six, um, is it just related to age or is there are there other restrictions in that? Okay, so lot six is, you're talking about the affordable. So the overall right. map has a requirement to do age restriction. And then there will be a, a requirement for units on lot six. And I want to—I can look back at the exact number, but I'm pretty sure it was 110 units. That's what I saw. To be deed okay. restricted as right. affordable, and I believe the term of that is a 30-year term. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a question, Mr. Jennifer. Uh, <coughs> is the only access? at least early on to this uh, development on Willard Road, or is there a place where they can get out to um, baseline? In the first phase, the first access will be Willard Road. Then the second phase will make the connection. Mm. I'm going to... Actually, ask Phil Franz to answer that to me <laughs> for me. Sorry, that's not okay. right. So, in the in the first development, uh, first developed phase, the access will be from Willerga Road with an emergency vehicle access connecting up to baseline. So that will be its second way out in an emergency. That will stay the same for phase two when phase two develops. That will still remain as the second point of uh, access. And then when phase three develops, that will be constructed as a road. So, open so it road. won't be an EVA then, it'll be a... Yes, at the third phase, it will be an open road uh, with a signal at the intersection at baseline. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. I think the colors are confusing me. <laughs> and I, I think I heard you say that the entire development is a uh, age-restricted? Correct. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you, Jennifer. Oh. <clears throat> Excuse me, my late, my late question. Would you reiterate that or clarify that the third phase, the stoplight will be where? Baseline and... Sure. Uh, on the third phase, so phase 1A and 1B are right here. Phase 2 is right here. And phase 3 is in this area. So when phase 3 develops, this road will go from an emergency access road to a full access paved road with a signal at this location right here on baseline. So there'll be a signal here and, an, and a road and a signal here and a road that will access the development first three phases. Perfect, thank you. 
I have a question, if that's okay. Absolutely. Can you can you go to the broad picture of, of the entire plan and just point out the next closest religious site in in the overall plan? So property one B has a religious site designated here. Property two also has a religious site. And property one B and three share like a common religious site. It's located right there also. We've mapped this on property 19. We've mapped this 20 acre piece right here. I guess in that regards, it seems like this is the second time we've had a request to modify a religious site. Overall in the specific plan, um, is it the intent that all of these are going to turn into high density? Uh, and if so, should we be looking at a modification to the overall specific plan to recognize that? And if it is, the religious site, I believe, is a contract under the specific plan. It provided a benefit to the future residents uh, to have facilities available, um, you know, to make sure there was a site available. How are we dealing with that? Uh, basically, I would like to see if you give something up, you get something at the same time and, and no net uh, loss in benefits to the community. Um, you know, how do you look at that in the specific plan? And I think maybe as a commission, I just don't want to see that every time we have one of these meetings, we're here looking at converting a religious site to high density housing again and have an overall approach so we can give the staff direction on how to approach these. Hmm. That's a lot of questions. <laughs> understood, um, understood. So I think. Question? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> I think, I, you know, um, we have to look at the request that's being requested today. They're not requesting an amendment to the overall specific plan. And originally, I believe there was a request back in 2015, 16, that was looking at some overall changes, and that was one of them being considered. Um, but that actually was withdrawn and did not move forward. This request that we're looking at today, we've analyzed and had to do that balancing out of changing and then what are we getting out of that? And with land uses like religious and versus providing the affordable housing, um, I think we've come to the conclusion that there's lots of opportunities. These religious sites uh, designation is a very unique designation. There isn't any other zoning or specific plan in Placer County that includes these types of uses. Um, they are there. They could provide a benefit in the future if, if somebody comes in and um, acquires one and gets a facility. Um, but in this particular case and what we're looking at here, I think we are just weighing the facts of providing that on-site affordable with um, houses of worship and religious facilities can go within it, the entire specific plan, the whole 5,000 acres. Um, and there's adequate both areas that are included in land designations for religious and then other properties for example, commercial or business park that could also be acquired and be developed. So, okay, so simply that the staff is recommending that there is an equal or better benefit to have um, the affordable housing at this location versus a religious site, correct? Is that what is the recommendation today? Correct. Then the second question, and, and probably doesn't apply here, but it's to the entire specific plan area, and are we going to continue to see religious lights coming forward, being requested to be converted to uh, affordable high-density housing? And if so, should we have an overall approach to, to making that happen? I, I think that's an excellent question. Um, I'm not sure we have one property left to come forward in the first phase of development, which is property three. Right, located right here, and they do have that corner of a religious. They've already approached us and have talked about what kind of uses or what changes they might want to make, but they don't have a formal application and submitted, and that's where we have to consider what the requests come forward. The full plan area is not coming forward with the request to say, here's how we should handle religious sites. So we would have to consider each request based on the merits of the request at the time and what the land use that they are asking for or not asking for. I mean, you could also, again, have a policy that said 
what happens to these religious sites. But I think that's not what we're, we're here asking with this particular development. We're asking and supporting the request to change it to high density. Understood. I'm concerned about piecemealing this plan over time, yeah. you know, for the entire Placer Gate. So that's my concern. Well, I, I would follow on that. that. That was my initial concern, too, on this, is that are we setting a precedence that opens the door for further developers to come in and, and do the same action? And I, I mean, just, I believe that these uh, facilities add to our communities and uh, are, are clearly a benefit to our communities. So I, I, just as myself a commissioner, would not be very favorable in the future. I just want to put that out there for any of the developers who are thinking about that in the future, that I would not be very supportive of, uh, of converting these to something else other than allowing them to continue to be used as uh, synagogue, uh, a church, uh, or whatever. Okay. One more question? Let me see, could you, maybe you can go back and see on, I'm still confused about where the trail, what the change is with the trail, and where sure. it's gonna run. I thought I understood it, but. No problem. I think I'm still confused. Okay, so shown on the left, the trail currently runs along the eastern edge of the plan area. And they're proposing to move the area from East Town Center Drive over to future Ninth Street. So the trail system shown in blue would go here. The trail system will continue along the frontage of Baseline and ultimately collect, connect to Willerga and will come down. So this will be part of a connection. It's just for the vineyards project itself. Instead of having a trail behind the houses, they've moved that trail to be internal to the street. What is that like a sidewalk or? Yeah, it's a class one, um, six foot sidewalk. Okay. Excuse me, eight foot. Then you also have a trail that goes through uh, an open space area. That's, a, that's what it connects to eventually, too? Correct. The, the trail system, the, the areas that are shown in blue are approved by the specific plan. And this uh, map is including the eight-foot class one trail. It will come down through this open space area. And actually, I did, forgot to mention this, that mm -hmm. they are connecting the class one trail system to uh, Doyle Ranch to the south. Okay. It's maybe 100 feet of trail connection. Mm -hmm. And that'll be done... I think it's 590 units. So somewhere after phase three, I believe, okay. um, that trail connection will be made. But and ultimately, then, this future trail connection, this is the edge of their property, will be made on property two. So this yeah. trail system will come in and connect back into this subdivision for like right. a regional circulation pattern. And is there a trail along the uh, town center road too, or is that not a trail? Correct. On Town Center Road, there is, it's on, I believe, the south side of the street. Okay. All the blue up there are Class 1 trails system. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right. We've got all the questions taken care of. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, the applicant like to get up and speak? Good afternoon, Chair Moss, members of the Planning Commission, Chad Roberts on behalf of the applicant. I'd like to thank Jen for her presentation, staff for all their hard work, County Council's office on this project. I'm pleased to stand here and say that we're in agreement with the staff report, everything that was presented to you today. But we do have our entire applicant team here with, with us in the event you have any questions. Brian Claycomb, Julie Hansen, Mike Smith, Donna Pasquantonio. Um, so if you have any questions, please let us know. Otherwise, we don't have anything to add at this time. Um, we would respectfully request that you approve the items before you today. And in the event that there's any public comment, we'd also ask for an opportunity to come back up and, and respond to it as appropriate. Thank you. Any questions of the applicant? Looks like Jennifer covered things very well. Thank she you. Did. Thank you. All right, we'll open it up now to, to public comments. Um, we'll limit those comments to, to three minutes. Please watch the timer. 
the yellow light comes on, you have about a minute to wrap up your thoughts. Okay, I don't think I'll take that long. Veronica Blake, Placer Community Foundation. I think that I'm really excited to see that the developer has proposed a project that includes construction of affordable units. When I read the staff report, I was a little confused about whether or not they were just going to be dedicated for senior housing or affordable, but I believe that that was clarified today, that they in fact would be deed restricted as affordable and senior housing. And with that, um, I, I think it would be helpful to see calculations on the prices that would be for either purchase or rental, but otherwise incredibly supportive of a developer proposing meeting its affordable housing requirements. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, seeing none, we'll go ahead and close. Um, I, I assume that there's nothing the applicant would like to get up and address regarding mm -hmm. the last comment. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, we'll bring it back to the commission. Discussion, comments, motions, whatever you might have. I, I have a few comments, and, and that is I echo my colleagues here in mentioning a concern about the um, replacement of religious sites. And I, I don't know, uh, I'm, all, I'm also passionate about affordable housing. And I don't know if it's, if it's right for us to be voting either, or is there a way where both can be accomplished. And I, I'm, I'm just concerned that the precedent that this could set as we continue to see other builders um, look at the religious sites as an opportunity to, to, uh, to do that for other reasons, not just affordable housing. So um, it's something that, that I'm conflicted with, and I don't, I'm not sure that that it's the only solution to, for us to choose either or. Uh, yeah, I guess a distinction that, that works for me is the fact that this entire project is age-restricted. And so the whole project has got the senior theme to it. Some of the ones that will be coming along in the future are not age-restricted. And so, uh, so that being the case, and it, you know, I mean, there's a distinction here. Now, the previous project where this came up, I think, has probably got us hung up a little bit because that went from religious to high density. And I think we were a little bit troubled by that in reflection. But in this particular project, due to the senior age restriction, that's what was able to sway me. I think the other thing that, that we need to remember is that a religious facility can go in almost any zone, including residential, uh, with, a, with a use permit. So if there is an extended need for religious facilities, um, the potential exists for that alteration, I think, to be made well into the projects, where things like the affordable housing coming in after the fact would, would raise, I think, a lot more concern. Uh, amongst the residents that were already there at the time um, and, and be harder to accomplish. Any other comments? I, I guess uh, the market for religious facilities is a little bit probably less than a market for high-density residential units. So, you know, I think there, um, you know, I think there is possibly a reason to have those designated to give those opportunities for re religious facilities in the future. And I, I think as was stated, uh, the concept of maybe there's some other locations, maybe there's some other things that could be done to, uh, to achieve both the, um, the affordable housing, but also benefits to the remainder of the community that that currently provides is worthwhile. So I guess one of the things I would ask is maybe not so much because I think, uh, as we discussed, I think affordable housing for over 55, I can understand the nexus there. But is it possible, EJ, to come back and do a workshop with the Planning Commission to talk about this before that next project comes in and look at some options, options on maybe partial reduction uh, of the religious facilities and trade for housing or what other things we're looking for, but at least that way the Planning Commission can have a open discussion before other projects come in and give the staff and yourself a direction. I think that's certainly an option. What I, what I would probably suggest is, you know, maybe staff reaching out to the owner's group 
to have these discussions. I think uh, a lot of them are here, not the owners, but representatives uh, in the audience today. So I think they're, I think they're hearing the message. So you know, we can start that conversation, see what comes out of that, and then uh, maybe follow up with the commission. And the other thing in the staff report, I would appreciate if you're deviating from the specific plan, though the specific plan allows you to make that decision, but what are the benefits, the change in benefits, and, and identifying what those benefits are in helping to make the findings uh, on a project approval? <laughs> Any other comments from commissioners or we'll open it up for a motion? There be one? I'll move to adopt a resolution approving an addendum to the certified Placer Vineyard specific plan final environmental impact report and amendments to the mitigation monitoring and reporting program attachment F supported by the findings contained within the staff report. For motion, do we have a second? I have a motion and a second. Roll call, please, Sue. I have a first by Mr. Hauge and I believe a second <coughs> by Mr. Nader. Yes. Uh, if I could have a vote for Mr. Cannon. Yes. Mr. Hersog. <laughs> I'm at a no because I want both. Mr. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Nader. Yes. Mr. Hauge? Yes. Mr. Sevison? Yes. Mr. Moss? Yes. Thank you. We have a motion on the second item. Uh, I'll move to adopt a resolution approving amendments to the Placer Vineyard specific plan, attachment B, supported by the findings contained within the staff report. I'll second it. We have a motion and a second. And I think we need to be clear that these are recommendations to the, to board, the of board of supervisors. To the board of supervisors. Yeah. So I have a motion by Mr. Hauge and a second by Mr. Nader. Uh, vote from Mr. Cannon. Yes. Mr. Hersog. No. Mr. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Nader. Yes. Mr. Hauge. Yes. Mr. Sevison. Mr. Moss. Yes. Thank you. Item three. Yes. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I'll make a motion to adopt an ordinance approving the first amendment to second amend and restated development agreement by and between the County of Placer and Placer 400 LLC relative to property 1A of the PVSP attachment C and supported by the findings contained within the staff report. Second. We have a motion and a second. I have a first by Mr. Hauke, a second by Mr. Nader, and a vote for Mr. Cannon, please. Yes. Mr. Hersog. No. Mr. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Nader. Yes. Mr. Hauke. Yes. Mr. Sevison. Yes. Mr. Moss. Yes. Thank you. Number four. Number four. Approve. Uh, I move. Uh, recommend to the board to approve the Placer Vineyards Property 1A Administrative Modification to Reline Town Center Avenue Attachment D, supported by the findings contained within the staff report. Second. We have a motion and a second. Motion by Mr. Hauge, a second by Mr. Nader, and a vote for Mr. Cannon. Yes. Mr. Hersog. Yes. Mr. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Nader. Yes. Mr. Hauge. Yes. Mr. Sevison. Yes. Mr. Moss. Yes. Thank you. All right, so we're at five. Is this where we would add in the errata? If the commission feels so inclined. Okay. <laughs> Make a motion to recommend to the Board of Supervisors to approve the Placer Vineyards Property 1A Small Lot Vesting Tentative Subdivision Map Residential Density Bonus subject to the conditions of approval attachment A, uh, including the addendum, is that the correct term, and supported by the findings contained within the staff report. Just to clarify, the addendum's the errata. I'm sorry, the errata. Correct. Right. Mm -hmm. Second. Second. Oh. Motion and a second. I have a motion by Mr. Hauge, a second by Mr. Sevison, and a vote from Mr. Cannon, please. Yes. Mr. Hersog. No. Mr. Johnson. Yes. Nate, Mr. Nader. Yes. Mr. Hauge. Yes. Mr. Sevison. Yes. 
Mr. Moss. Yes. Thank you. All right, with that, I guess this is not an appealable item since this is just a recommendation to the board. So I think we've got it all covered. Thank you all for coming out. Meeting adjourned. Congratulations.